playable. I mean, it, the, the uh, superintendent, Matt Stevens, is just fighting to keep the place alive. And several golf courses in, that I know of nearby in South Carolina have lost their greens mm. and are on temporary greens. And it was for, for over two months, the heat index was in three figures every day which is appalling. I mean, bent grass greens, you know, you virtually have to keep them like a bog. You know what surprises a lot of people that, that when they hear that Augusta National is closed in the summer from May until October and they say, what? That beautiful place shuts down for all those months? Is that why? Absolutely it's why. And uh, of course they, they usually redo the whole thing. It's an extraordinary procedure. Big Ross, you know, in their pursuit of perfection, they will do everything they can to make sure it's perfect the following April. And uh, I mean, they, they will literally plow it all up and, and, and reseed if, if uh, they feel it needs that. Most everybody listening to this program uh, will never get to Augusta National, maybe not even to see the Masters Tournament because the tickets are so hard to get. Mm -hmm. And it's virtually impossible to play there because the membership is so small. You have been inside the gates for many years as a player and as a broadcaster, can you tell uh, everybody listening, what is it like to uh, go and play at Augusta National? Well, the first time uh, I came from England um, and, and was taken down uh, Magnolia Lane, the entrance to the club, in the club limo from the airport. And uh, I got, the hair was standing out on my arms and the back of my neck. and. It still does today, and that is, you know, uh, I'm talking about 1965 that I first went there, and it's still an extraordinary experience to go in through the gates because outside the gates, it's fast food capital of uh, Augusta and or Georgia probably, and uh, <clears throat> it is so pristine. Everything is so well ordered and. Uh, the greatest experience I think I ever had was to be invited by Mr. Hord Hardin, who was then the boss man, uh, to spend time with him in one of the cabins, uh, uh, and it was Eisenhower's cabin. Mm -hmm. And I actually, we came in on uh, Monday night and left on Friday morning in the week before the Masters. So we played the golf course absolutely as it was to be played and that was a frightening experience but uh, you know we had breakfast in the men's grill upstairs lunch in the locker room grill downstairs and dinner in the main dining room uh, cocktails uh, in the cottage but i had president eisenhower's actual bedroom mm. and the walls were totally covered by black and white pictures of everywhere he had served, every base uh, on which he had served his country. And it, I'll tell you what, that is some experience. Uh, it really was, and uh, I shall never forget it. We played the big course at 9.30 every morning with Mr. Hardin, and everybody scuttled out of the way when they saw him coming. So we swept through the course like a, a you know, torchlight procession. <laughs> and uh, then uh, Mr. Hardin, after he'd lunched us, said that he had work to do, which was a total lie. He wanted to go and rest. Uh, but we went out on the par three course, and uh, Frank Chikinian, my old boss, and Pat Summerall and I played skins until it was time to clean up for cocktails. Uh, and you know, what an experience. Uh, what a lucky man to have had that experience, you know, who. Who I mean, there's very few people who get that uh, experience, and and to sleep in the president's bedroom in his cabin was, well, high cotton. You had the run of the place. Absolutely, the run of the place. Yeah. And then next week, you climbed up into the tower there behind 15 and 16, yeah. mm -hmm. and watched all those great players come through. Yes, and I did that actually uh, 23 times. Uh, I started at 14 where they put all rookies because in those days particularly uh, they didn't show much of 14 except the putting because the, the green is fairly eccentric mm -hmm. and um, 
then I had the good fortune to make a good impression because at my first master's, Peter Roosterhaus had the lead and it was rained out. And he had a day and two nights to sleep on the lead. And uh, of course it was a little too much for him. And Tommy Aaron, native son of Georgia, uh, prevailed. But I had to do a 27 minute interview with Roosterhaus uh, when the rain out started. And uh, that was my first real experience of being thrust into the limelight with CBS. And uh, I must have done a decent job because Mr. Clifford Roberts, who, as you know, ran the place with an iron glove, uh, said to my boss, who was then Bill McPhail, um, move that young, young right to a more pleasant position. And I was moved in my second year uh, to the 15th hole, where I uh, sat for the remainder of my tenure the best spot for the action? Oh, unbelievable. I mean, I, I, I had quite a setup towards the end when I was doing 16 as well, because uh, you, you had to swivel around in your chair to physically watch. So they had uh, monitors for both holes. So I actually had nine monitors, I believe, uh, which was, you know, it was fairly complicated. And uh, when you spun round to do 16, towards the end of the broadcast, you got your son in the eyes, uh, which they face at 15. Uh, you know, there, there's always the sun in your eyes in the closing stages, which is not the easiest of uh, tasks to accomplish going over that water. So I, I saw all kinds of drama there, and it was just remarkable. And of course, I suppose, uh, really, the high spot was Jack Nicholas's eagle uh, in 1986 on his, en route to his victory at the age of 46 uh, and coming back in 30 with a bogey, you know, it, a bogey at 12. And, uh, I mean, it was... I never heard a noise like it, Michael. And I couldn't hear Frank Chikinian for the only time in my 27 years with the, with the network, I couldn't actually hear him for the noise uh, of, that greeted the eagle by Nicholas, which really, I mean, it virtually sealed the deal, although he nearly holed in one at 16 mm -hmm. uh, moments later. So, uh, it, you know, it was something that I shall never forget. And I didn't know what to do because I couldn't hear Frank. So I kept it, and I just, I just sort of, um, I, I laid out while the great man walked to the 16th tee. I just laid out. I didn't say a damn word, mm -hmm. and, and let it play, as Frank would say. You know, he would, he would say, "Shut up, let it play," on numerous occasions, and quite rightly, um, you know. And it, uh, it, that will be with me forever. Let it play. We will let it play when we get back in four minutes with Ben Wright, the Emmy Award-winning CBS golf commentator, author, Bon Vivant, and the host of the Ben Wright Invitational this weekend here at Crystal Mountain Resort in Michigan. I'm Michael Patrick Shields. His book is called Good Bounces and Bad Lies, the autobiography of Ben Wright. It's available at Amazon.com and most places wherever books are sold. 18 after the hour, we're back in a flash. <laughs> 